Greetings, folks. Today we're going to talk about sine waves. The introduction to alternating current, AC. This is the key element. We need to talk about how the current or voltage waveform changes over time. What's the simplest thing that can happen? Well, the simplest thing would be to imagine uh, a simple rotating vector, like the second hand on a clock. And all I care about, this thing is rotating at a constant rate. All I care about is what's the displacement vertically. I don't care about what's happening side to side. I just want to know what's happening vertically. All right, so the second hand would start, begin to rotate, come back around, and just keep doing this over and over and over at a constant rate. So what's happening with the vertical here? Okay. We could plot it, it would look something like this. So here's time on this axis. And on this axis, you know, whatever we're interested in, I mean, this could be voltage, it could be current. Um, but basically what's going to happen is it's going to start here at zero. All right, so just imagine the tip of this moving. And it comes up to a peak, goes back down to zero, goes to a negative peak, comes back up to zero, and then the process repeats. So again, vertical displacement, this is what we see. Comes up to the peak, goes back down to zero, goes to the ne to negative peak, and then it repeats itself. Right? So we call that a sine wave. And to quantify this, we need to know a couple things. What is this peak amplitude, right, which I'll just call k, and then how long does it take for it to repeat itself? All right, what is that time period? So capital T. We call that the period. Now we can describe this equation, right, the, this, this uh, shape with a simple equation. Um, instead of using the period t, typically we would use the frequency f, which is just the reciprocal of it. So frequency is essentially cycles, there's a cycle, per second. How many cycles do I have per second? The unit for that is hertz, named after Heinrich Hertz, right? abbreviated hz. So if we were to think of um, let's say human hearing, the range of frequencies a typical human can hear, young healthy human, on the low frequency end, the base end might be about 20 hertz, and as we go to the high frequency end, you might be able to hear up to maybe 20 kilohertz, 20,000 hertz, right? It's about a thousand to one change in frequency. Okay, so the general sh the general equation for this shape is going to be k times the sine of the quantity 2 pi ft. So f is the frequency in hertz, right? The 2 pi, of course, is the radian frequency uh, conversion. And then t is the time of interest. So I might say, you know, what is uh, the voltage at this instant in time? You know, what is that? So I would simply plug in the little t for this, knowing what the frequency is, knowing what the amplitude k is, and I could figure out the associated value, right, what that is. Turns out, typically, we don't need to do that uh, in our circuit analysis. That's useful sometimes, but generally speaking, um, we're not throwing in values of, of little t there. Okay? So if this was a voltage, just to put this in perspective, right? If this was a voltage we were talking about, um, we would talk about the voltage as a function of time, V of t, and that e would equal the peak value over here, which we would call Vp, capital Vp, right, the peak value, times the sine of 2 pi ft. Right? So that's our, just our basic wave. So really the only variations are just how tall this is, right? What's the peak value? Um, and just how quick it is, how many cycles I get in a second. In lab, sometimes we refer to a peak-to-peak -peak value, in other words, from the positive peak to the negative peak, instead of just talking about the peak. Uh, 
what other kind of variations do we have on the theme? Well, we could also have a DC offset. Right, so we know what DC is. If I add DC to this, what it does is it pushes this whole waveform vertically, up or down. If it's positive DC, then it goes up. If it's negative DC, then it goes down. In other words, we'll see something along this line. If I had a, a positive DC offset, we might see something like this. Right, so there's my sine wave. It's riding above the zero point, right? Riding above my axis. And it would be up by some DC value. Now, the equation we would write for this, I would say that P of T would be equal to that DC value plus the sine wave. In other words, plus what we saw before, B peak sine 2 pi FT. Now, if we have um, uh, a negative shift, right? So if the waveform is down here, so forth. The only difference is this quantity right here is a negative number. Okay, so whatever it is. And it might be um, a small shift. I mean, you might have something that's, uh, you know, a small negative shift. And you get something like that, right? So you've got still a portion of the waveform that's negative, but most of it's positive, or vice versa. You know, a little bit of positive and a lot of negative. Or it could be, you know, way the heck up here, way the heck down there. You can have a lot of DC shift. But that's all it does. It just moves it up and down, right? The end. So, as an example, you go into lab, you look at uh, an oscilloscope, because that's really where we're heading with this, and I see a waveform. And I want to write the equation for it. So, you know, what I see, you know, looks something like this. Um, Let's say this right up here is at plus 5 volts. And right down there is at minus 5 volts. And the time right here is, uh, let's say, 1 millisecond. All right, so if I were to carry this out, it would be 2 milliseconds for the next one and 3 and so on. So what's the equation? Well, first of all, the plus and the minus peaks are at the same magnitude, plus 5, minus 5. So there's no DC offset. Right? If there's a DC offset, then the positive peak and the negative peak are different numbers. If they're the same, then this thing has no DC offset. So the peak value is just this, the 5 volts. Right? If it did have an offset, you could just take the difference between the two peaks. That would give you the peak-to-peak -peak value. Divide that by 2, and you'd have the peak, and then you could figure out what the offset happened to be. So I know that much. The other thing that we know is the time period right, for one cycle, that's one millisecond. And the frequency is 1 over t. So f is 1 over 1 millisecond, which is 1 kilohertz, 1,000 hertz, 1,000 cycles per second. So the equation for this, b of t, is that peak value 5 times the sine of 2 pi f, which is 1,000, t. And I could, like I said, plug in a value of little t over here to determine the specific voltage at any given instant in time. But that's the expression that we have. Now, if we had a DC offset, okay, so suppose this was shifted so that it looked like this, and this peak up here was at plus 6, and this peak over here was at minus 4. Well, this thing still has a total 10-volt peak-to-peak swing, right? You're going from minus 4 up to plus 6. So that's still 10 volts peak-to-peak. -peak. Well, 10 volts peak-to-peak -peak would be 5 volts peak. So the difference here is there's an offset. Um, you know, how far, have we, how far have we gone, so to speak? Well, clearly from a non-offset version, which is plus and minus 5, we've gone up 1 volt, right? So this negative 5 went up to minus 4, the positive 5 went up to plus 6, there's a 1 volt shift. So this thing turns into 1 volt DC plus 5 sine 2 pi 1000 T. All right? 
Beautiful. Okay, now, other things that can happen. You can have a time shift. You can have a left-right shift as well as an up-down shift. And this is particularly important when we have multiple waves because I want to know how one wave is in time compared to another one. All right, so instead of starting my sine wave, I'm going to forego DC for right now. Um, I'm, instead of starting it here at zero, I'm going to push it along the axis a little bit. I get something like this. Okay, so T, big T, the period, is still the time between these zero crossings. That doesn't change. However, we have a new thing going on here. And that is this displacement, All right? So we have a distance from here to here, All right? You could call that um, like a little delta t, right? A little change in time. So, what do we have there? This this is referred to as a time shift, or more typically, a phase shift, because instead of um, Talking about this in terms of, uh, you know, it's so many milliseconds or microseconds or whatever the heck it is, that doesn't give me enough information unless I also know what the frequency is. Because, you know, a one millisecond shift would be pretty small if you're talking about a 10 hertz waveform. You know, the, the period on a 10 hertz waveform is 100 milliseconds. On the other hand, if you're talking about a one megahertz waveform, the period is one microsecond. So, now, just talking about the amount of time doesn't give you the whole picture. So instead, we relate this as an angular shift. So the phase, little theta here, um, we can compute that as the percentage of a cycle. In other words, a full cycle is 360 degrees, and our percentage is this little delta T over big T, the period. So... You know, over here, this looks like it's maybe, you know, 20% or so of this full cycle time, right? You know, like if this came like out down here somewhere, um, you could see, okay, that would be like a quarter of a cycle, but it's less than that. So, you know, maybe it's, like I said, 20% or something like that. So I would say, okay, that's 20% of, of 360 degrees, right? That's a 72 degree shift. Now, what I care about is, is it to the left or is it to the right? So we have um, the idea of, of leading or lagging phase shifts. So if it's shifted this way, right, as this one is, this is a lagging shift. If it's pushed that way, it's leading. Now, a lot of people get confused by this. The thing to remember is it's lagging it's later in time okay this is time going you know further and further along this is late this point is later in time than this point is so if you push the whole thing this way it's lagging if you push it this way it's leading and lagging is a negative leading is a positive and we add a term to our generic sine wave so if this was a voltage I could say that V of T, and again, I'm going to ignore the DC offset here for a sec, would be some peak value, VP, times the sine of 2 pi FT. I'm going to put this in parentheses so there's no confusion. Plus or minus whatever this shift is. All right, so if it's pushed this way, it's a negative. If it's pushed that way, it's a positive. And that's the general equation for this. And yes, finally, you can add the two together. In other words, you can add a DC offset and a phase shift, in which case, you know, we would have um, sort of our ultimate generic equation. Um, and again, I'll just use voltage. You can say, well, that has some DC value. And then our sinusoidal portion of it pi ft and then there might be a shift okay all right 
So, and again, you know, VDC over here, of course, could be a positive or negative. So if you really want to be persnickety about it, we'll put that in. So that's our really general equation. Shifts this way, shifts this way. Okay. All right. Now, on a scope, typically you would be looking at multiple waveforms. And you want to know what the relative phase shift is between two waveforms. All right. So instead of thinking of this um, vertical axis as your uh, reference point, right? I want to talk about one wave with respect to another. So let's just take this waveform. I'll call it this waveform A, and then um, I'll draw another one over here. Waveform B. So I want to know, yeah, I want to know if I can draw better sine waves. Um, Bear with my less than beautiful drawing. So what I would like to know is, what is the phase shift of A relative to B or B relative to A? You can do it either way, right? You could say, so here's, here is the shift, right? This is the little delta T that we would care about. And then of course you have your uh, big T, your period. And by the way, you can't compare phase shifts if the frequencies aren't the same. That's nonsensical. They have to be, a and B have to be the same frequency. Otherwise, you can't really talk about phase shift. Okay, so you can say one of two things. You can either say that A leads B, or you can say that B lags A. The number is going to be the same. What's going to change is the, is the sign. All right, so if we're going to use B as our reference, we would say that A leads B, and it would be a positive phase shift. If we're going to use the black A as our reference, then we would say that B lags A, right? And that would be a negative phase shift. But the magnitude would be the same number in this case, right? Um, other variations, you might hear um, people talking about cosines or minus signs or minus cosines. So all a cosine wave is, is the sine wave shifted, right? First off, we could talk about a... Um, a minus sine wave. All a minus sine wave is, is a sine wave that's been shifted by 180 degrees. You put a minus sign in front of it, and what you get is this. Right? Everybody that was positive is negative. Everybody that was negative becomes positive. You're just flipping it upside down. So there's your minus sign. Right? So that's a 180 degree shift, plus or minus, wherever you want to look at it. You can think of that whole thing being shifted over. 360 for the whole thing. 180 for a half cycle. So if you pushed it this way, right, you'd have your original sine wave. So you can think of it as, oh, it's lagging by 180. But if you went the other way with it, because of course this continues back like this, and you pushed it that way, you could say, oh, it's leading, right? It's leading by um, 180 degrees. And then your um, cosine wave basically just starts at the positive comes through like that and then of course as you might guess a that's our cosine and then our minus cosine is just a flip of that so it goes like this okay so the the cosine is basically leading by 90 and the minus cosine is lagging by 90 normally we're going to talk sine waves but sometimes it's useful when we do uh, derivations and math to remember that cosine waves and sine waves are really the same thing. It's just a matter of shifting. Okay. Okay. So the obvious question at this point is, um, what if I have a, a more complex waveform? If you listen to a sine wave, it's just a single simple tone, like a whistle. Okay. But, you know, a voice or music or what have you is much more complicated than that. There's lots of different frequency elements in there. It turns out that no matter how crazy looking the waveform is or how it sounds, you can build it from a whole bunch of sine waves. And this is called Fourier analysis. And so you might be familiar with something called Fourier series. But essentially what this does is it breaks apart your complex waveform into a bunch of frequency components. So here we are looking at this in time domain, but we could also look at it in frequency domain.
So frequency domain, it would look like this. So this is frequency over here instead of time. And as I said, you know, if you were listening to this as a human, you can hear from maybe 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So this axis would be in hertz. And if this was a single sine wave, like a one kilohertz sine wave, there would just be a spike here. And I would just say, well, it's some amplitude. It's, you know, five volts or whatever the heck it is. And it's uh, sitting here at one kilohertz. So that's the frequency domain version of it. Now, if I look at, um, like I said, maybe a, uh, a recording of a musical instrument, you know, saxophone, oboe, guitar, whatever, you're going to see a pretty funky looking waveform. It's not going to look like a nice, simple sine wave. You know, you might get something, just squeeze it in down here. It'll probably be, it'll, it will be repetitive if it's a pitched instrument, but, you know, you might get something that kind of goes, you know, kind of like that, okay? At least as well as I can draw it. You could talk about the period of the whole thing, but it's really a much more complicated waveform. It turns out something like this can be broken up into a whole bunch of different frequencies. All right, so in other words, you could imagine and I have no idea what it is for this funky looking shape, but you know, there might be other elements out here. So you might have something at two kilohertz and something at three kilohertz and, and so on and so forth of all these different amplitudes, right? Basically, if you change the way something looks in the time domain, you change it in the frequency domain and vice versa. That's a really important thing to remember. If you change the frequency domain, you're gonna change the time domain. Now, just to give you a real quick example, you could take a waveform, like a square wave. All right, square wave just looks like this. This is actually made up of, because it's not a simple sine wave, it's actually made up of a whole bunch of sine waves. In fact, the spectrum of this is very well controlled. Whatever this frequency works out to, right, you got this period, let's say it's one kilohertz again, you would get a one kilohertz spike like you did with the sine wave, but then you'd have all these integer harmonics. So if this was at a, a unity amplitude, you'd also wind up, so let's just say this is like, uh, you know, one unit, one volt, one kilohertz. You'd also wind up with something at three kilohertz, and it would be one third the amplitude. And you'd end up with something at 5k at one fifth the amplitude, and something at 7k at one seventh the amplitude, and this would go out to infinity. You add all those little pieces together, you get a square wave. Now, usually when I explain this to people, they're somewhat incredulous. They can't imagine how all these things would go together and create a square wave. They do. Here's how it works. Take the sine wave. This is your base. Right? This is your fundamental, as we would call it. Now what I want to do is add one-third the amplitude at three kilohertz. So in this space, there's going to be three cycles. So there's going to be three half cycles here and three half cycles here. That's going to look something like this. One, two, three. Now, graphically, just add these together. In this area, this area, you're going to get something bigger. In this area, you're going to get something smaller. It's sort of the inverse over here. Now this new blue waveform is not a sine wave. It's not a square wave. To me, it always reminds me of a molar, you know, it's a tooth wave, whatever. But if we start adding more and more and more of these, in other words, if I add one fifth at five kilohertz, what you'll see is ultimately you're going to get a waveform where these ripples get more and more numerous, but they get smaller and smaller and smaller. So you add, you know, maybe 10 of these harmonics, and you're going to get something that kind of looks like this. And you're getting pretty darn close to a square wave. Right? There are some nice graphs of this uh, in the textbook, drawn much better, you know, with an appropriate uh, plotting program than I can ever hope to do by hand. But you can prove it to yourself very easily. You can write a little computer program to sum up um, the amplitudes of these various sine wave components, and you'll see very quickly, you wind up with a nice square wave. Same thing is true with a triangle wave, 
with uh, a ramp, any kind of shape that repeats like this, you can turn it into this series of, of uh, elements. And this is important when we think of things like uh, filter design, because I want to keep or I want to get rid of certain parts of the spectrum, certain frequency elements. Okay, great.